Hi, this is Mark Birch, and today I'm going to be taking a look at the revision of Macbeth Act 2, Scene 2. One of the first things we notice in Lady Macbeth's utterances are her use of antithetical parallelism. These are a form of parallelism, where you have the same syntactic structures on both sides of a sentence, that are based around opposites. So here, what I'd argue is that the use of antithesis um, gives a sense of the natural response in the men as opposed to her unnatural response. So it's made them drunk, it's made her bold. It's quenched them, it's put out their fire for life, it's put out their energy, their enthusiasm, as they are soaked in alcohol, they are drowning in this drunkenness. And it's given her fire. It's emboldened her and made her passionate. Lady Macbeth's clearly agitated with what she's done and what um, is happening at this moment in time. She hears a noise and she's clearly startled. It was the owl that shrieked, the fatal bellman which gives the sternest good night. And uh, this is another bird of ill omen. We've already heard one of them referred to, the raven. The raven himself is horse. But this is another one that represents death. And this owl is metaphorically referred to as the bellman, who in Jacobean England would ring a bell to indicate that someone was about to die and that they should therefore be prayed for. So on both levels, we have clear symbolism that relates to the murder of Duncan, that there is about to be a death, both through the reference to the bellman and through the reference to the owl itself. Lady Macbeth's role in the murder is made even more explicit here. We've already witnessed her persuading Macbeth to kill the king, but now we learn that uh, she's drugged the possets of the grooms, essentially drugged their drinks, and laid the daggers ready. Everything is prepared for Macbeth by his wife. We then get a good example of the way in which Shakespeare has used structure to create particular effects. Here it's stichomathia, the rapid movement from one person's utterance to the next. And I've dragged Connie in off the English corridor to try and demonstrate this. So thanks to her. When? Now. As I descended? Aye. Hark, who lies in the second chamber? Donald Bain. This is a sorry sight. So hopefully you can see that the rapid movement from one speaker to the next, the uh, break in the metre, can structurally reflect the kind of tension and uncertainty felt by both Macbeth and Lady Macbeth. And also the frequency of the use of interrogatives complements that too. Uh, we've got so many questions being posed by both characters that you can't escape the sense of uncertainty. We're then introduced to the motif of disturbed sleep, one of the most common and important motifs within the play. It's something that's repeated time and time again in this act and obviously takes a significant part of Act 5, Scene 1 with Lady Macbeth's sleepwalking scene. And when we're looking at some of the specifics that Macbeth explores within the context of the disturbed sleep, we have this reference to these hangman's hands, as if they'd seen me with these hangman's hands. Um, that would be a really powerful image for a Jacobean audience, because the hangman would have this really grim duty of butchering the corpse of a traitor, potentially disemboweling uh, those people who had been hung, and therefore it would capture this sense of the grisly and the bloody, um, something that um, echoes the way that Macbeth feels about his own current status. He's covered in this blood, and that blood represents his guilt. It's worth recognising that uh, when Macbeth says, I could not say amen when they did say God bless us, that this would be really significant, particularly to a profoundly Christian society. Uh, God blesses would be used as a ward against evil. So Macbeth, having committed this terrible act of regicide, isn't able to say amen because he's cut himself off from God's protection. He goes on to say, but wherefore could I not pronounce amen? I had most need of blessing and amen stuck in my throat. Well, he may have had need of blessing, but he doesn't deserve blessing because he's committed this terrible act. Lady Macbeth's subsequent response, these deeds must not be fought after these ways, so it will make us mad, is foreshadowing the theme of madness as it appears later in the play, both in terms of the madness of Macbeth and the madness of Lady Macbeth. I won't go through all of the areas, you can see some of them on the screen there, but madness features very widely across the play. We've already heard that sleep is a key motif in the play. 
And here we have sleep personified as innocent. Given Macbeth's guilt, profound guilt, given his murder of Duncan, his access to sleep is denied him. When he says Macbeth does murder sleep, um, sleep's murdered both literally and figuratively, literally by the murdering of Duncan in his sleep. Um, so we have there the murder of an innocent. It distinguishes it from the other kind of killings that Macbeth has been praised for in the past. And the kind of figurative killing of his own capacity for sleep through the committing of that murder. Macbeth goes on to explore the significance of sleep and the symbolism of sleep at some length through a consideration of its positive value. And of course, through that, there's a sense of his own guilt, his remorse, the self-loathing that comes about through being denied sleep as a result of his actions. One of the first things he says about sleep is it's, it knits up the raveled sleeve of care, which is a metaphor based on textiles. Um, a sleeve in this context is a kind of loose strand of fabric. So the cares or the worries are those loose strands that sleep has got the capacity to knit up or put back in place so that we have a kind of fully resolved sleeve. And similarly, you get that same concept explored through the metaphor of Saul Labour's bath, as sleep is presented as something that can soothe the pains of a hard day's work. Again, something that's denied Macbeth. The metaphors continue with uh, balm of hurt minds, where sleep is the oil or balm that metaphorically soothes those hurt minds. And with great nature's second course, chief nourisher in life's feast, Sleep's given the most important aspect of that metaphorical feast. So it has the power to nourish. Again, it's that nourishment that's denied Macbeth now, maintaining this sense of self-loathing and the sense that he's lost out in life as a result of his actions. This idea is hammered home in Macbeth's statement that um, he will sleep no more. With the repetition of that phrase and the concept of murdering sleep illustrating the depth of his guilt as those concepts assault his psyche. Lady Macbeth's presented as having no time for this kind of remorse and self-pity. She says, uh, worthy Thain, you do unbend your noble strength to think so brain sickly of things. Now this is an image that's based on archery through the idea of bending and unbending a bow. Um, to bend a bow is to use your strength and to unbend it or to let it go is to release its strength. So here essentially she's suggesting that Macbeth has lost his strength by thinking brain sickly of things. It's worth comparing this to Act 1 Scene 7 uh, where we have I am settled and bend up each corporal agent. Now that claim uh, that Macbeth said that he would apply all his strength to the murder of Duncan is again taken from archery, yet now Lady Macbeth recognises that that strength which he did claim to apply previously has been lost as a result of his guilt and remorse and self-pity following the regicide. In contrast, Lady Macbeth displays great strength. She issues a series of imperatives as she controls the after effects of the murder, as well as, of course, the murder itself and the planning of the murder. So things like, you know, go get some water, wash, go carry them, smear. And the resolution of Macbeth that uh, we'd heard alluded to from Act 1, Scene 7, uh, the one that was referenced through the archery imagery, is now completely lost. Macbeth says, I'll go no more. I'm afraid to think what I have done. Look on it again, I dare not. Um, a complete contrast to I am settled and bend up each corporal agent to this terrible feat. Macbeth's response transforms Lady Macbeth's lack of pity into something stronger, an anger. She states, infirm of purpose. Um, this is the same criticism which she charged Macbeth with in Act 1, Scene 7, where she said, was the hope drunk wherein you dressed yourself? Uh, she was criticising Macbeth's lack of resolve, and again here, because he's infirm of purpose, she's claiming that he lacks resolve. She goes on to link sleep and death as mere representations of life, comparing them to pictures or paintings, and as a result, they're not worthy of fear. She belittles Macbeth once again, stating that only a child would fear these representations of life. And she goes on to say, if you do bleed, I'll guilt the faces of the grooms withal, for it must seem their guilt. 
And you can hear in the um, representation of that that guilt and guilt act as homophonic puns. Um, the D would be pronounced as a T. And that guilt, as in G-I-L-D, means to paint with gold, to render something more valuable. But in this instance, it's to cover the grooms in the valuable blood of Duncan, to guilt them so that their guilt, G-U-I-L-T, is illustrated through that process. And then we reach one of the most famous images in Macbeth. Uh, this is Macbeth exploring his own guilt. Uh, blood symbolises guilt in the play. He starts by saying, you know, what hands are here? Ah, oh, they pluck out mine eyes. So we get that profound nature of uh, Macbeth's guilt illustrated by his claim that the sight of the blood on his hands plucks out his eyes, a really extreme hyperbolic image um, one that's associated with violence. And then we get the famous line, Will all great Neptune's ocean wash this blood clean from my hand? No, this my hand will rather the multitudinous seas incarnadine, making the green one red. So essentially Shakespeare's using this hyperbole to reveal the extent of Macbeth's guilt. Words like all, uh, Neptunes, uh, given that Neptune's the Roman god of the sea, and therefore vast in terms of power, and multitudinous, many, convey that vastness of the ocean. Yet to Macbeth's mind, it's not sufficient to watch his hands clean of the blood. So this huge amount of water, um, a vastness that's one of the greatest things imaginable in the Jacobean period, would be insufficient to rid him of the guilt of his action. Instead, he claims, his bloody hands would turn the ocean red if he tried to wash the blood off his hands. That guilt that he experiences is so vast and overwhelming that it would transform the ocean. It's worth noting the similarity here with Lady Macbeth's hyperbolic imagery in Act 5, Scene 1, where she refers to the blood on her hands as well. After attempting to remove a spot of blood, she says, all the perfumes of Arabia will not sweeten this little hand. So we have again with her this parallel idea that something vast, in this case the perfumes of Arabia, which is where all perfumes would have been derived at the time, cannot get rid of the smell of blood. It echoes Macbeth's idea presented in this scene and provides a brilliant comparison if you're looking at uh, the difference between Macbeth and Lady Macbeth and their changing attitudes during the course of the play. The colour symbolism in Lady Macbeth's My hands are of your colour but I shame to wear a heart so white symbolises the cowardice that she recognises in her husband. They're the same externally, they both have the red blood on their hands, but internally there's a massive contrast. The bravery of Lady Macbeth is being juxtaposed to Macbeth's cowardice. We also have an implicit contrast to Macbeth, because Macbeth's reference to all great Neptune's ocean being unable to clean his hands, and then here Lady Macbeth's a little water, being able to clean her hands shows the profound difference between the two of them. It's also worth noting again that uh, contrast with Act 5, Scene 1, where Lady Macbeth mentally returns to this moment in the play and, like Macbeth, seems unable to remove the blood from her hands. She says at that point, out damned spot, and yet that's a huge contrast to the idea presented here that a little water clears her of this deed. And finally, Macbeth says, to know my deed, to a best not know myself. Essentially, if I knew what I'd done, I wouldn't want to know myself. He's experiencing again this self-loathing, this self-pity, this enormous regret. But his response to that is to almost deny reality, to go into a kind of fantasy realm, or as Lady Macbeth describes it, to be lost so poorly in your thoughts. And that regret that self-loathing ends the scene. When Macbeth says, wake Duncan with thy knocking, I would thou couldst, the final sentence is a clear wish that uh, he could turn back time for Duncan to be alive. Okay, so 